Before I start, any questions on this stuff? So even if you guys aren't really getting the while loop syntax and the if statement syntax, I do want to stress that one of the most important things is understanding how to break down a problem. Like, this will not just help you for programming, but also in like life, like diagnosing mechanical problems for a car, like isolating what the issues are with that, or like uh, uh, solving like a, a, a challenging uh, homework problem for another class, like identifying how to solve that. Where to start is just as important as knowing how to do it. The term. We went over that. Finicky counter. Um, I want to review this, this counter because this is basically another variation of how to set up a while loop with an if statement. And uh, it's kind of like the, uh, the simple case here. I just want to show like how you can set up a, a simple counter here. And this is just a review. Um, remember that we had a counter that counted up to some number. And if the counter is, this is the other part. This while true, while we've been using true up to this point, remember that you can put in an expression here. While the counter is less than 10, you can loop through this. So remember that we have if statements and, and we have breaks, but you can also just put you can also just put the expression right in here, which will mean that the loop will continue as long as this is true. So I just want to show you that you can set up a, a counter like this. This is not anything that is uh, very different from what we've done, but if you set up a counter like this, you can count from 1 to 10 by creating a variable and then adding 1 to it every time through the loop. I'm going to show you guys today how to use a new loop construct that is the same idea, but is more built for counting up or counting down or looping through things. While loops are great, but I'm going to be honest, like most of the time we write loops, I would say most of the loops that I write, if I was to have to quantify, like give you a number, I would say like probably eight times out of 10 or nine times out of 10, it's going to be what's called a for loop. And I use while loops still occasionally, but while loops are like 10%, 10, 20% of what I write. And it really depends on what I'm writing, but I would say for loops are probably the most common one that I write day to day. So look at what this, how this thing is constructed here. I have a counter, I have a condition, and I add one to it every time. Okay. Let me take this moment to uh, make sure that I have this set up correctly. So... So I want to review, we talked about this, we talked about logical not and logical and, logical or, I broke down. This is how you set up an expression. You can combine expressions with logical and, or you can have uh, several expressions combined with logical or. In the logical and case, all of these have to be true. In the or case, only one of them has to be true for the whole thing to be true, and not just reverses the, the statement. So this is an example of a combination using the AND operator. So look over here on the right. This is the expression that it's comparing. It's saying if your username is equal to Sid Meier and the password is civilization, what is the result in the various cases here? So in a case where you need both of these to be true, which means the username has to be equal to Sid Meier and the password has to be civilization. So breaking down the problem, if the username is Sid Meier, you look at this. If this returns true, you're going to see true here. So this is saying, OK, I don't know what username is, but it's either going to be true or false. This expression is either going to be true or false. Same thing for password. This expression will either be true or false. Looking at nothing else, password is either going to be equal to the word civilization or it's not. So here, it's going to say true in that case. So the way you read this table, this is called a truth table is there is a row for every possibility of this expression, where, in this case, both of these can be true. The left one can be true, and the right one can be false. Or the left one can be false, and the right one can be true, or both of them can be false. That is every possible situation for this expression. There's no other situation. There's no other combination 
of true and false. So in the first case, if both of these are true, this expression is true. That's how and works. That means that this is true, the username is, is equal to admire and password civilization. If this is true and this is false, the result of this is false as well. Likewise, for if the username is not Sid Meier, but the password is civilization, this is still false. And if both of them are false, this is false. So in this case, the way that and works is both of these have to be true for the result to be true. If either of these expressions are false, the whole thing is false. So when I go to the or operator, the way you read this is here are all the possible situations again. And here is when those situations are true or false, when you combine them with the OR operator. In this case, if both of them are true, the result is true. If either one of these is true, the result is still true. And if both of these are false, the result is false. This is how the logical OR works. Questions on this? So this is a review. And then the logical NOT is that. Okay. I want to talk about game loop a little bit. Because we've been using while loops, but uh, in order to make a game like what we're going to be doing, which is making tic tac toe in this class, which is going to be starting, we're going to start that next week. I want to talk about how a game like Call of Duty or Gears of War or Overwatch actually works. And this is a really basic um, flowchart that describes how like, almost any game works. So you got to follow the arrows. You're starting at the top where it says setup. And any game from Pokemon to Mario follows this kind of similar situation. This is, you can see here, there's, if you look at this flowchart, there's actually an arrow that goes back around. This is what is the whole thing combined as a game. First thing that happens in a game is you start it up. You spin it up. Typically that means you load any resources that the game needs. Like you need to load the main menu textures, you need to load the assets for uh, the heroes, you need to like load in any DLLs and libraries that you need. You need to, uh, if you're playing a multiplayer game, log in and connect. So there's all this setup. During this time, after you've done the initial setup, the first thing you're going to be doing is you've entered the game loop. Imagine this loop, this circle here, is running really fast. It's doing this 60 times a second, 60 frames a second on average for a game, sometimes more, sometimes less. But it kind of follows a strict set of uh, sequence of operations. The first thing is you ask the player, hey, what are you doing right now? Are you moving the mouse? Are you using the joystick? Did you press a button? Did you type something on the keyboard? It does this 60 times a second, though, remember. So it knows, it is asking essentially 60 times a second what you've done. So the first thing it says, oh, oh, I see. He, he pressed start once, last frame. He pressed it. Or he moved the mouse slightly to the right. OK, he moved it right about half an inch. He moved the mouse about half an inch to the right since the last time I looked. I saw he was over here. Now he moved the mouse over here. OK, I've got I to remember that. Based on that information, and other information, let's say, coming from across the network, you do uh, a game update. You update the game as a result of both the results, the input from the player, and uh, from the previous frame, or from results from other players who are playing the game, too. You move the camera when you move the mouse, in like an FPS. You click the mouse. So, oh, I need to make a projectile that fires out. Or, Oh, so I saw someone else move their character in game, so I need to move him in your game as well. Updating game internals basically kind of like sets up everything, almost like a claymation or like stop motion. You kind of like set up everything, you pose everything right, and then once you're done, you're like, okay, let's just leave it like that for this frame, and then we'll move on. Then you present that to the screen after you've updated everything. This is the render frame. Right? You render everything as a result of the update. Then you check, should I keep doing that again? Do I still need to do that again? 
most often times you are. You're doing this 60 times a second. You haven't exited the game. You haven't shut down yet. So you go back. You get the player input again. You get more input from other players, too. Oh, he moved the mouse again, and he clicked. OK, let me remember that. You update game internals. You move everything. You pose it again, right? Everything gets repeated over and over again. This loop runs effectively as long as you're playing the game. And it runs in that sequence. Any questions about this? It kind of makes sense, right? Like how the, the, a game works. Any game functions in this way. Like, you take a game like Pokemon, what are you doing in Pokemon that you're interacting? Even if two Pokemon in, in that game are just looking at each other in a battle screen and nothing's happening, you're still doing this. You're still getting the player input. However, sometimes the player hasn't done anything, right? Which means, oh, player didn't do anything. I need to update anything that's changed. Nothing's changed. All right, we'll just present the same thing again. Or, oh, well, animation has changed a little bit. I need to update the animation, but I don't need to do anything else. Even when you're not interacting with it, the game is still looping, right? So the key is to get this thing as fast as possible in the case of Overwatch, right? Overwatch, we're really, really keen on making sure that you feel like your inputs are responsive to what you see in game. So the less often this thing runs, the more likely it is that you feel like you did something and it takes time before you see it. You guys ever run with like low frame rate? You probably know, Brent, <laughs> considering the PC specs that you have. If you're running at less than 60 FPS or you're running like really bad, like 10 FPS, which means you only do this 10 times a second, it means that there's a lot of time in between each of your reactions. It means that all your actions are feeling sluggish. Like real life updates, like, you know, effectively this loop in real life is infinitely fast, right? It has it's super fast. But in the case of a game like Overwatch, we want to make this thing run at the minimum of 60 times a second. That's really important. If you have a really good PC, you can make it run at like 144 frames a second or faster. But the key is to make this thing as small as possible because we can perceive, our, our brain and our eyes can perceive motion at a pretty high rate. So we can tell when something is running slow or, or fast and uh, you can tell when a game's running at low frame rates or at high frame rates. So the key is to make this thing as fast as possible. How do you do that? How do you make a game run as fast as possible? How do you make this loop as quickly as possible? What stops this loop from going as fast as it can, actually? Why isn't this thing running effectively infinite frames per second? Why does a game even run at like 20 frames a second? What makes a game take longer to do this? Hardware? No, what part of this do you think takes time? Updating the game and updating the display. Those two things, they're not instantaneous. It's, it's the exact opposite. Those things take a lot of time to do. Moving a character, creating a projectile, receiving inputs. Like when you move a character in the game, you can't just like, it's not free. Like when you're moving character, you're actually doing like collision testing. You have to like, okay, before I move you, I need to do all this math to figure out whether I hit something or not, right? That takes time. Literally, it's the, the, the processor can only do so much. It takes time. It literally takes time for it to run like an addition operation, right? To, if, you tell the, if you tell your processor, hey, add these two numbers together, it's like, cool, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. It takes like a nanosecond, but it takes time. If you have thousands of operations all happening, it takes thousands of nanoseconds to perform those. When you're moving a character through the world, there's thousands of operations that happen as a result of you moving the character, moving bones, you're transforming positions of the verts on the arm, or you're doing collision testing, you need to compare two numbers to each other. This update loop can sometimes take a while. The longer that takes, the lower your frame rate is. For instance here, to get 60 frames a second, your update loop needs to finish in 0 0.01666 seconds. You have to finish updating everything in that many seconds. That is 16 milliseconds. If you cannot do everything your game needs to do in 16 milliseconds or less, your game will not run at 60 FPS. Your game will run slower. 16 milliseconds, how fast is that? Does anyone have any idea? You guys, let me put it in the context of ping. You guys ever play with ping that's like 100 or 200 ping? Yeah. Sometimes. That 200, 200, that's in milliseconds. So 200 milliseconds, that's how long it takes 
That's basically one fifth of a second, right? 16 milliseconds. Sometimes I get 16 milliseconds ping, right? But you might be able to tell 16 versus 0. You can certainly tell 16 versus like 100. So, If my frame, for instance, let's say I took 100 milliseconds. It took 100 milliseconds for me to move everything and update my game. I'm running at 6 frames a second. That's really bad, like 6 frames a second. So it's really important that you run at 16 milliseconds. And I'll tell you what, it's hard to get a game to run that fast. It's even harder to get a game to run in under 7 milliseconds to update everything. Can you give you guys some context here? Um, like, you could probably do maybe, maybe, a, well, let's say like 10,000 square root operations in under 7 milliseconds, but it's kind of it. Like, square roots are really expensive to do. I'm just kind of giving you guys some context. Like, about 10,000 or so, let's just say, square roots you can do. Once you do more than that, you can't run at 144 frames a second, OK? Like, there is a limit that we're always fighting. Now, processors are getting faster at doing this stuff. That's why the evolution of games has been able to progress, because the processor manufacturers are able to give us more utilities, faster access to operations. It can perform arithmetic faster. It can perform arithmetic on uh, vectors. It can perform arithmetic and division operations quickly. It can get memory faster. There's a lot of things in here that take time. And it's exacerbated the fact that that's just the game. Displaying also takes time. Rendering this stuff and figuring out lighting and shadows, that also has to finish in less than 7 milliseconds if you want it to run at 144 frames a second. One of the benefits, though, is that we can actually split the game update and the uh, render update into multiple threads. So we can actually do both at the same time, roughly, because we have processors that are multi-threaded. And we have a GPU that can run operations on it at the same time. But regardless, the most expensive operation has to finish in under 7 milliseconds. Okay? That's why like, you see games that run poorly. Like you guys, I heard something about uh, Forza Horizon 3 running poorly on PC, as well as um, what games are running pretty poorly? Batman, you guys know about the Arkham yeah. thing? Yeah. There's like a problem with Arkham running at like 30 frames a second. Because they couldn't finish the game loop in under 16 milliseconds. They had more work to do every frame than they had time for. Which means that you can't, you can't like update the display. You can't go past this until both of these things are done. Like You can't show the world without updating the game. If you guys have ever actually seen this happen, you might have seen a glitch where the game like freezes, yeah. and then like every, nothing, everything stops moving. Usually, uh, you see either because the game thread has been like, I'm still doing work. I can't give you anything right now. I'm taking a long, it's taking a long time for me to like access your hard drive and like get these textures and load them. I just can't give you anything right now. And the display is like, well, I'm just going to be over here waiting because I have nothing else to do. Uh, so tell me when you're done, I guess. And so it locks up. Or like um, if you're waiting on display, like the game is running, but the, the frame rate is like choppy. That can be an indication of the display taking a long time. To update. But this loop, I want you to imagine this loop when we're making our games, because this is basically what we're making. This loop is represented very simply. It's just a while loop in there, literally a while loop that runs as fast as it can. I need an octa core. What's that? An octa core. An octa core? Well, eight core, multiple cores only helps you if the person that wrote these internal game update and display updates have threaded the workout. If you're running an old game, it doesn't use multiple cores at all. It doesn't matter. For our game, it doesn't matter if you have a single core or not. You can get a 42 core PC. If you play, if you're going to run on a tic-tac-toe game, it's still going to run exactly the same frame rate as if you ran it on a single core PC. Because the way we're writing is all happening on the same thread. There's only one, one of those 42 is doing all the work. The other 41 don't give a crap. Yeah. So, like, you're saying, why do you see people jumping around or a lot, why, like teleporting? Why do you see like just like a person? Like, 
frozen screen, yeah. and then everybody else around you apparently... It's still fine, right? Yeah, they're fine. Like, why isn't this happening? Well, so when you're playing a multiplayer game, there are... This is for one computer. So you are running this on your machine that you're yeah. playing on. There's a server running over the internet that's also running this that's separate from yours. It's running its own thing. Most of the time, servers don't have this, by the way. They don't have the update display, because servers don't care. Yeah. They don't have to display anything. But for a server, what the server does in here is he figures out everything, and he sends that update out to all the players. That's his job, is to tell you what the state of the game is. And in your loop, at this point, you're getting that information. You've gotten the results from everyone else. So everyone essentially has their own version of this. So maybe on your PC, you have a slow video card and a slow computer. It takes you longer to do this part. Right? Or like you have bad network connections, so you're getting bad information from the server. Everyone else, they're running this really fast. Like I'm running this on a fast PC. Because we all are running our separate simulations, we all have our own game loops. We all are unaffected in some way by others. But for instance, if you're locked up and you're not able to update this fast, it means you're also not telling the server what you're doing as quickly either. So to other people who are watching you, like, I'm going to see you moving in a weird, kind of a weird way. Like, you're not going to be responsive. Like, you're not going to be able to react in time if your frame rate is really bad. Like, if we're playing Overwatch together and you're running 10 frames a second, I can tell that you're running 10 frames a second because you're, you're, like, doing this kind of thing. Like, you're trying to update, but it actually doesn't look good. So, on the update display, um, I've been running into this problem like a couple times already. So, I'm playing on Diva, uh, and they knocked me out of my Mac. Mm -hmm. I'll start shooting, but then my screen goes black, and then it comes back. Like if I reset into my back again. Um, so there are a lot of places that that can fall apart. For instance, there is. Uh, it, it gets kind of interesting because Overwatch is a multiplayer game, but because we're a multiplayer game, uh, we need you as the player to tell the server what you're doing, right? So let's say you let's say you click fire on your machine. You say, hey, I want to fire right now. Cool. The way that multiplayer games should be architected is that you tell the server, hey, I want to fire. Like, you're, uh, imagine I'm the server and you're the client. You click the button. What you should be saying to me is that, hey, could, could you please create a bullet for me? Like, I'm pressing the mouse button right now. Can you please pr create a bullet for me? And it's up to me to create the bullet. A lot of ways you do it incorrectly is if like, your job is not to create the bullet. Your job is just to tell me to make it for you, okay? That's the first step. So when you're playing as D.Va and you're like, you got blown up or you shot your bullet, um, you're actually telling the server what to do. But you're not telling the server, like, exactly what to do. All you're telling me is what buttons you press. That's all we send. Like, our cl Overwatch clients, all we do is we just tell you, the, we just say what buttons you press. That's it. That's literally all you do on your machine. You just say what buttons you press. The server takes care of everything else. There is a problem, though, because um, let's say you're running on a bad, let's say you're playing on dial-up, and you have like a 300 millisecond ping time or whatever. You click a button. It'll be 300 milliseconds to take that button press, send it up to the server, and there'll be another 300 milliseconds for the server to tell you, oh, cool, yeah, I created that bullet for you. Go ahead and make it on your screen. Which means that every time you click the bullet, Every time you click the gun, it takes like over half a second for you to see that bullet show up on your screen, right? You guys ever played multiplayer games that like do that? Like there's like lag, like you shot a rocket or something. Yes. Yeah, it takes yeah. time for the rocket to show up. That's because the server needs to tell you to create the rocket. Now what we do is we want to make that feel good because it feels really bad when you click and it takes time. We can't change the laws of physics. We can't make that stuff get to your machine faster. There's just no way. It's literally going to take, at the very least, half a second to get that information up to the server and then back to you. Nothing we do is going to change that. There's literally nothing we can do. Um, but what we can do is hide it a little bit. We can make it seem like you shot that projectile right away. We can uh, simulate particle effects. We can play the audio. We can even make a visual that looks like a projectile that starts moving on your machine. However, it's all fake, right? It's all fake. It's just basically you click the button, and from your perspective, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, uh, the server hasn't heard about it yet, but you, you're going to be like, let me just make it right now. Let, let me just pretend everything's going to go great. I'm just going to make it right now. I'm going to wait to hear from the server. The server gets back to you half a second later and says, cool, yeah, you know that projectile you told me about that you want to make? Go ahead and make it. And you'll be like, yeah, I already made it, so just tell me where it needs to be now. You'll basically take your projectile and you're kind of like, 
correct it so it's in the right spot. But from your perspective, the important thing is you click the button and you saw like a muzzle flash and you heard the sound, right? This is called predicted gameplay. We're predicting what's going to happen. It's really important to do because otherwise it's going to feel sluggish. Movement is a perfect example. If you do not do this in a multiplayer game, if you do not predict the movement, like when you press W to move forward, and you tell me that you want to move forward, if you don't move forward on your machine until I tell you to, it's going to feel like super sluggish. You're going to press it, half a second later you're going to like lurch forward. But movement is perfect. It's really easy to predict movement for the most part. When you press W, we have a contract basically. You're going to say, okay, I'm going to assume that everything's going to go right. I'm going to just start moving forward. The server is later going to tell you, hey, everything's good. You can go ahead and move forward. And you yourself on your PC have already decided to move forward. So you're kind of like pr predicting that everything's going to go okay and just relying on the server to tell you that, okay, yeah, what you did before, what you predicted is correct. What you run into, though, is if you guys ever play multiplayer games where you like rubber band, yeah. you go somewhere and then all of a sudden you're like back at a yeah. previous location. Yeah. That means that you predicted somewhere where you should move, and the server's like, whoa, you, no, that's not where you're supposed to be. Like, you tried to move there, but there's someone standing in the way, or there's something else that caused you not to be able to move. Someone stunned you. So, like, you're predicting, yeah, I can go, I can go walk over here, and the server eventually gets up to you and says, like, yo, what are you doing all the way over there? You need to be over here instead. Like, you incorrectly predicted. That's what's called a missed prediction. So when you move and you don't actually correctly move in the right spot, then we have to get you in sync with what the server has. So we'll teleport you back. Um, that happens a lot in one of my games. Yeah. Overwatch, we try to do a, a better job of that. There's a lot of things that we try to do to make it and hide that fact. But yeah. That's actually what I was trying to say earlier. Um, since you guys have put the patch out for Overwatch, it's been happening to me quite a lot. Yeah. Um, I'll be going and then it'll overbend me back. And I'll be like, OK, go back. And then it does it again. And I'm like, what the hell? And it'll just disconnect me. Some of that is a server DDoS attacks. So if the server is getting attacked, for instance, uh, the server can't actually tell you in time. So like, if you move a lot, the server's like, oh, I, 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 it's like, it's like choking. It's, it can't get you the information. The, the farther apart you guys get, the longer you spend before you like, basically talk to one another, the more likely it is that you're going to end up mispredicting where you should be. So pretty much just stay there. If you stand there, it'll be fine, because the server's like, yeah, that's where you should be. But uh, also, if you move in straight lines, that makes it very easy for the server. The more you move around corners and stuff, it makes it pretty tricky. OK. So let's take a look at for loops. So uh, that was game loops. A game loop, in its essence, I, I do want to show you a little bit about what a game loop does, what it looks like, because I think it's one thing to talk about it, but let's just replicate what a game loop actually looks like, right? Because I talked about the game loop and the render loop. I'm going to simulate what this is. Player input. And then this is it. This is our game loop. Um, let me put another uh, line in here. Where is sleep? Sleep in here. Uh, Thread.h, maybe? Totally forgot. Where is this? Excuse me while I show you guys what it actually looks like. Uh, let's see. This is what I want. Let's do uh, this. 
Let's slow it down. Let's do one per second. So imagine this is our game loop. Our game is running currently at one frame per second. Okay? Our game loop normally runs as fast as it can, right? But in this case, I'm just kind of breaking it down a little bit. You can imagine that basically it's doing a bunch of work in each one of these things. And watch what happens when I start putting some really difficult things that it needs to do. For instance, if I make a counter here, I'm just going to, in my game loop now, I'm just going to say my game is literally going to count from the number 100,000 down. And let me get rid of the sleep here. Let me show you guys, it, when it runs as fast as possible, when my game loop is running as fast as possible, it looks like this, right? This is my game running at, I don't know, 300 frames per second. If I make it do some work, for instance, I talked about how it takes time for the processor to do stuff. In this case, it takes time for it to count down from 100,000. Let's do, let's do a little bit more. It looks like it's able to do that really fast. Let's make it do some more work. I'm just going to keep adding stuff that it can do. hundred times more of the amount of work. <laughs> Can you guys see it's stopping at game update? Like what did I have it do? I'm having it do the square root operation like a hundred thousand times. Watch it's actually stalling out here. What if I multiply this by another? I make it do ten times more work than before. Look how long it's taking to run my game update. Right? It hasn't even gotten the render. It's doing work. It does it, it finishes it. Look how slow my game loop is now, right? Imagine this is a game that's like, imagine like chugging along, you ever play a game that's like all oh, just stalling out? Well, this is the kind of thing that it could be doing. It could be updating the game. The faster you get this, the faster you have it doing work, the more often your game can loop. Okay? So what is, what is this? If you do 100 million square root operations, you get to like, what is it? One frame every four seconds? It's like 0.2 FPS? But this is a good example of how my game update can take time. And you can do this in the render update too instead. So maybe before it actually does the render, it takes time. Right? So it renders, takes some time to present the frame. So even though I'm kind of doing a convoluted example, this represents why it takes, uh, it's hard to make a game that runs fast. And in most cases, you're going to be running a lot faster than this. But uh, if you have really have 100 million square root operations to perform, it's going to be kind of slow. Okay. All right. Questions on that? I think I kind of I think I kind of beat that dead horse into the ground. You guys can understand how game loops work. That's what we're going to do. We're going to make a loop that looks a lot like this, and it has a little stuff that we do, like figure out positions and do collision detection, and then we're going to draw it on screen. Okay. I want to talk about the third type of loop that we haven't discussed yet, which is called a for loop. Now, the reason why I want to talk about this specific loop is because it's one of the more commonly used ones. And a for loop, functionally, is the same thing as a while loop. It allows you to loop over some statement. It allows you to repeat a statement over and over again. But a for loop is a kind of like a recipe. It, it gives you step-by-step -step ways of how to perform those actions. It's kind of like a way to set up everything up front. In a, it's like an easier way to set up something that counts. Okay? In this case, there's kind of four parts to a for loop. that there's, You follow these steps when you're making a for loop every time. Okay? So I want to talk about each of these steps, which is the, the usual parts of a for loop. Uh, the first step is anytime you're dealing with a for loop, you're typically creating a variable and you're initializing it to some value. Just like what I did in the counter. If I go back here, if I, if I use my simple counter as an example,
Like in this case, I'm creating a variable and I'm initializing it to a value. When you're using a for loop, you are told where you're supposed to put that. The second step is performing a test. Should I keep looping or not? Same thing that a while loop does. The next thing is to do whatever the loop is supposed to repeat. So you have your statement for the loop. The final part is updating the value you used for the test. Let me show you what a for loop looks like first. So the for loop here in code looks like this. And then I'm going to break it down and explain what it is. A for loop functions by setting up a bunch of stuff inside parentheses. Like there's a bunch of stuff in here. But then ultimately what it ends up doing is still repeats whatever comes after. It just repeats everything that's inside. So all the stuff that's inside that parentheses, what normally was just an expression, is now three different expressions inside parentheses separated by a semicolon. It seems like a lot of work for something that is just supposed to loop. But it's actually very useful because when you look at what you normally use a loop for, oftentimes you're doing something like this, where you are having a variable and you want to repeat a certain number of times. In this case, my program, I want to loop 10 times, right? I want my program to loop 10 times. This is actually such a common thing to do, which is to loop over something a certain number of times. That's why the for loop exists. Because you do it so often in games, there's actually a special way to write this loop to save you time from doing what I did in this program, like this. You can essentially do what I did on three different lines, all in one line, which is a reason why you would use a for loop over a while loop. For instance, I use for loops to iterate over everything inside, like all heroes in the game. For instance, when I'm showing like the UI for, let's say, hero selection in Overwatch, the first thing I want to do is collect all the heroes that I'm allowed to play as, which now includes Sombra. And then for every one of those heroes, I want to show a little image on the hero select screen. So I'm going to loop over all the heroes, all 23, and I'm going to draw an image. So a for loop lets me loop over every hero. And that's it. Like, I don't want to go any more or any less. I want to go over every single hero. So it basically replaces the standard way of looping over something a certain number of times, looping over this plot. So there are three pieces to this for loop. Let's talk about the first piece. Notice these are all separated by semicolon. The stuff in italics is an expression that you put in C++. You don't actually literally put the words plus expression or anything like that. You replace this with the code that you want to write. So the first step is initialization. So initialization is the first thing that happens when you run your loop. The way this loop works is you write for, you write a bunch of your conditions, your expression, your update expression, your initialization, and then it follows a very specific step through your loop. The first thing that happens is it runs whatever code is here. Whatever code you write here, that's the first thing it does, and only does this once. No matter what you write there, it'll call it and do it one time. Okay? The second part of this is the test expression. I'm just going to summarize this for you. It says loop as long as this right here is true. Okay. It just says, look at test expression. If it's true, go ahead and run the loop. This is exactly the same as a while loop. Whatever you would put inside of a while loop is the same thing you would put inside here. Then you have this update expression. This is a line of code that runs every time through the loop after the loop has finished. So it will run the body of the loop here. After it's done with the body, then it runs this line of code here, which is the update expression. It's any C++ expression.
So here's a flowchart of how it actually works. As I mentioned, the first thing that happens is you initialize the for loop. You run that initialization expression and you do it once. That's the first thing you do. The second thing you do is you test the expression. You see if the thing in the middle is true or false. If it's true, you run the body. Then you run the update expression. Then you test it again. You repeat this. This is the loop part until that middle expression is false. As soon as it's false, it exits the for loop and runs the statement. Okay. I'm going to show you guys this. I'm going to go back to this uh, program here. In this example, this is the initialization portion of the for loop, the first part. This is the condition, the test expression. And this is the update expression. OK. I'm going to write an example that replaces this with a for loop. Okay. So I'm going to delete this. We're going to actually uh, write the four. I'm going to put empty parentheses. And now we know we have to fill in three things here. Oops. So the three pieces, I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint here, are initialization, test, and update. So I want to counter, I'm going to write a program that counts up to 10 by writing it with a for loop. The first thing that I want to do is I want to create a variable for my counter. Remember, I'm going to just, I'm actually going to keep this, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take this whole thing here. I'm going to keep it on the right side so you guys can see. So we can compare what it looks like for a while loop. So on the right is my while loop. This is what normally done. So in the case of the while loop, the initialization is this guy right here. There's a counter variable that gets created. So I have my for loop. I'm going to do my initialization first. So I'm going to create a variable called counter equals zero. That's the first line of code that I want to run, and I only want this code to run one time. The second line of code is what? The test expression, right? This guy right here, the test expression. So let's write that guy. So what is the test expression in here? Counter is less than 10. Counter is less than 10. So I'm just going to write counter less than 10. The third part of my for loop is the update expression. This thing will run after the body has executed. So what do I want to do here? What, what did my while loop do on the right here? It added 1 to the counter. So I'm going to take counter as my third part. Let me make this bigger. This is my for loop. Let's break down each piece. I'm going to put each piece on a separate line here just so we can see the three parts. This is the initialization. This is test expression. This is the update expression. Okay. That's all that's what each of these three lines are. Initialization. I create a variable called counter and I set it equal to zero. The test is as long as this is true, I'm going to loop. The last part is hey, after each time through the loop, I want you to add one to the counter. So can anyone tell me how many times I'm going to loop this thing in here? How many times is this loop going to run? 
10 times because it's the exact same loop as that while loop from before. Exact same loop as this. We know this ran 10 times because the way that the program works I'm just going to run this and I'm going to show you guys the output here. Do you see it's counting here? So I know it runs 10 times, but let's actually step through here because I think I want to step through here line by line to show you what actually happens. So I hit my yellow arrow here. This is what the program is about to run. So the first thing that happens is I have a variable called counter. It's currently equal to negative 85, 85 million. So I'm going to run this line of code right here. Okay. Zero. The next thing that happens, look where the yellow arrow is. It's going to test to see if that number is less than 10. If it's true, it's going to run the body of the loop. Remember back to this right here. Initialization, test, then body, then update. So watch where the yellow arrow is going to go here. So after I hit the next arrow, where does it go? Let me write the line numbers here. So what line number is it going to go to after it ran this? If I hit this, watch where it jumped to. It went to 9. Why did it go to 9 and not here? Remember the flow chart. Because it runs the body. Yes. So remember, it tests first, then the body, then the update statement. Okay. Remember, the update statement is right here. So the order of operations is this then test, then body, then update. It jumps backwards up top. Watch where it goes here. After it's done with the body, watch where it went. went to 7. OK, anyone besides Brent, can you tell me where <laughs> it's going to go next? What line is it going to go? Back to the test. Back to number 6. Because think back to the flow chart here. Think about this, test, body, update, test, body, update, test, body, update, test, body, update, test. This is the body, this is the update, this is the test. So watch the yellow arrow, it goes back up to 6, then if this is true, back to 9. Back up to 7, then 6, then 9. 7, 6, 9, and 6, 9. That's how a for loop works. It's a little weird because it doesn't run top to bottom. It goes into the body, then goes back up. This is one of those things you're going to have to remember what the order of operations is. You have to know that a for loop runs this, then this, then the body, then update, and then repeats back up here. OK, knowing that, here's what I want you guys to do. I want you guys to make a for loop that does two things. One, it counts up to 100. And two, it counts up two at a time. So I want you to take this for loop that I wrote. And I want you to make it count up to 100 first. Then I want you to make it count up by two at a time. Remember, this one right here, this right now, is any C++ expression. You can literally do a standard C out here. Okay. But what I want you to do is I want you to count, have this for loop count up to 100. Get that working first. Make it count up to 100. And then I want you to add count up by two. Once you're done with that, I have another one for you guys to do. Get it? 
Okay. I want you to count down from 100 to 0 now. Okay. Once you have it counting up to 100 by 2s, I want you to have it count down from 100 down to 0. By 2s? By 2s, yeah. you, Mike, can you write a loop that prints out, um, it's going to be representing the, the numbers on our grid, Okay. so can you print out the multiplication table? So you know how multiplication prints out, it would be one row that is like one times one equals one, like, like one times one equals one, one times two equals two, three, four, five. The next row is two times one, two times two, two times three. Okay. Printing out a multiplication table that looks like like this, and then this would be if I if I actually represent this, this is one, two, three, four, five, and across the top here, it's one, two, three, four, five, like so. Uh -huh. Do you remember the multiplication yeah. table printout, right? It's 2, 4, 6, 8. Let me know if you need help writing the for loop, because uh, I will come around and helping you. Once you're done with counting upwards to 100, I want you to count down from 100. And then once you're done with that, I want you to print out the multiplication table. And I'll do this with you guys. This is more for the people that got done early, so I can help out with everyone else. So this is, which one are you going to count, count up to? Oh, so you have an extra semicolon there? I was just trying to run one. Oh, OK. So let's give it a shot. That's good. Can you build it?
Okay, here, let me show you what you're supposed to do to count up to 100. All right, this is counting up to 10, right? This first one? When counting down, do we count down to 1 or 0? Count down to 0. is just a special operation. Literally all it does is add one to the number. How do you add the number two to a variable? So how do you change a variable? How do you, I just forget about adding. How do you change counter to be equal to 42? Make counter equal to 42. Okay, how do you make it equal to 42 plus two? Okay, so you know how to assign the variable, right? What if I said, instead of 42, why don't you use the value of counter instead of 42? So, so I think I should go back and explain variables some more. So let's, let's, let's start from the beginning. I mean, let me drive for a second here. What is the difference between doing this? I'm going to set this variable to five. So that's changing the value of counter, right? Does that make sense? Like, this is a variable that's named counter. There's a value stored inside, right? 
There's a number stored inside the count. What is what is count equal to? We can change the value that's stored inside that variable that's within inside the variable, right? We can change it as much as we want to. Right? We're changing the value of the count. What is this doing here? So, so the only time that a variable actually changes is when you're using this operator. So what you're actually doing here is there are two different things you can do to a variable. You can, you can imagine that the variable is like a continuous line. You can either change what's inside of it, or you can read what's inside. You can look at it and see what the value of it is. Those are the two different things you can do to a variable. One of those two things. You can't. You. Um, they're all exclusive, like this in this case here. When we're doing when counter equals 412, we're changing what counter is equal to. We're actually modifying the value of it. The variable is now holding the number one. Right? When we do something like this, I'm just going to do C out. We're not changing that value, right? We're just reading from it. We're not modifying. We're just saying, hey, what are you right now? We're reading the value. And that's what that is doing, right? So when I do this, what is that doing? So this case here, there's no assignment. I'm not changing anything. Here's what it's doing. It's reading the value of counter, just like it was before. Then reading the value from before, adding those two together, and that's it. It's not changing counter, right? This operation. That doesn't modify the counter. Right? That just takes this, adds it with this, and it gives you a new number, which is the result. So what is what is this? If I take counter plus 10, think about it this way. Whenever you see it like this, replace this number here with the value of what counter is. What is the value of the counter right now? Yeah. Okay, so you do that. Then you do this arithmetic operation, so 412 plus 10, that becomes 422, and that's it. The counter hasn't changed. Remember, we're just reading the value. So what happens when I have a line like this? Yes, the counter doesn't change, though. What happens if we just add those two numbers together? Oh, it's 422, and then it immediately forgets about everything. It doesn't change count. If I print this out again afterwards, like this, what is this going to be? What is this value here? What is what is the value of counter when I print this out? What is going to print out here? Yes. Because we didn't change it here. We just added it. How would I change counter to be equal to 422? What do I need to do? Just look here. Look what I did up here. I assigned it equal to count. I took what's on the right and shoved it into count. So if I take this, this, there's two distinct things that happen. I'm taking counter and I'm adding 10 to it. So if you remember, the result of this is what, 422? And then I'm taking that result and I'm putting it into this variable. OK? So now what does this print out? Right, because you change it in there. There's a right side, it does this first, and then it shoves it in. Okay? So if I do this again, it takes this, what is this? Tell me in your head like what this number is on this line of code. What is, what is counter, what is the value of counter going to be right here? 412 right here? 422. Because we just change it right here, right? This is 422 now. We have 422 to 5 and 12. And we now what's counter going to be? It's whatever 422 plus 5 and 12 is. So, is this good? This is a good thing, right? Yeah. But what is this? This is exactly the same. It's a short version of doing this plus 1. Okay? So when you see the for loop, when we write our for loop, counter. Let's 
So now you know what this is doing, right? This is doing this right here. So now, how do you change it so that it instead adds two every time? What do you need to write here instead? How do you change the value of counting to two? What if, can you replace this with this? Just do that first. Replace that plus plus with this. All that is, it's just this is shorthand for this, right? I'm going to show you one more thing that's important. There's another way to write this. There's another shorthand version exactly the same. This is exactly the same as this. These, all three of these are exactly the same. Can you see plus equals? It just means this. So when I do what is happening here? Can you rewrite this line to be like the other line here? What is that equivalent? <laughs> yep, exactly. Those are exactly the same. You do the same as that one, right? So now what I want you to do is take this. Convert it to Convert this to these three we always plus equal plus one. How, do you, how would you rewrite this up here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's exactly the same. So I want you to rewrite this. I want you to actually go in here and change this to be added by two as this one, these three plus equal to one. They count up by two. That's the shortest version, that's the shortest way you can write plus adding two to it. Now you understand that this is the same as doing counter equals counter plus two. Right? Okay. So now what I want you to do is I want you to make the same count from one hundred to one hundred. You can get rid of all this or you can keep it. You can put a semicolon right there at the end. Make sure it doesn't uh, break. Oh, I, I, would, I would run this program. I would just run it once. But don't forget your semicolon there. It just gets How's your multiplication table look at? This is cheating. Yeah. Uh, I don't have any counter. Is that, well, that, that's not actually a multiplication table. Right? Yeah, I didn't know exactly what you wanted. That one didn't kind of look like a multiplication table. Like, <laughs> You know, from like second grade or third grade or, wait, no, that would be second grade. I don't know what multiplication would be. But it looks like this. 3, 6, 9, 12, 14. Okay, who's done with, who needs help still? Are you doing multiplication? So you start with zero and you want to count down. I'm trying to show you one hundred. So um, you have almost everything right. The graph is doing this is what the curve of So what I'm saying here is that it actually won't be happening. It's not Right. So the reason is because the first thing it does is the initial action. And the second thing it does is the whole is true or false. So if you work your head, what is the you is the first thing you have to make one and one and one. So Thank you. 
show you guys how to do a multiplication table. Okay. Nice. You got the nested loop and everything. I just I just had to look up how to do the tab other than that. Yeah. Um, okay. I didn't care about the tabs or anything like that. So let me go over how to do the uh, the for loop to count up to 100. So we have our loop that counts up to 10. I want to change it so it counts up to 100 instead. Now this is going to count up to 99. How do I change it so it includes the number 100? I need to do right. I need to do greater than either or. You can do 101. So I'm going to do greater than, less than, or equal to 100. Or you could change this to be 101. I would prefer you do this because it makes more sense. You're counting up to the number 100. You see the number 100 there. You're like, oh, that's what it's counting up to. It makes a little bit more sense. Either way is correct, but this is a little bit more my preference. Then how do I add two <coughs> to the counter? I'm adding one right now. What is this expression actually equivalent to? This is actually equal to counter is equal to counter plus one, right? That's what that thing is actually equal to. So if I replace this, that's what plus plus does. This is this is actually the long way to write out counter plus plus. If I want to count up by two. I do counter equals counter plus 2. Because that way I have an expression that adds 2. You can see it's counting up by 2. I have an expression that adds 2 to the counter and then assigns it equal to there. I can count up by any multiple I want to. I can count by 10s if I want to. You can see it works that way. How do I count down from 100? Well, considering this is the initialization expression, this starts at 100, and I know I want to count down by 2, this is the test expression. It says this has to be true in order to run my body. Right now, it's only true if my number is less than or equal to 100. Watch what happens when I run this, by the way. Infinite? It's not, because it always is true. We need to switch this so that as long as it's greater than or equal to 0 is the only time we want to loop. We only want to count down as long as the number is greater than 0 or equal to 0. Okay. All right, so here's a nifty trick, though. This is a 100. I'm just going to count up by ones. There's my loop, my for loop. You can combine multiple for loops inside one another. Well, one thing I want to say, too, oftentimes when you're seeing for loops, you won't see the variable like counter. You'll probably see something like the letter i is what we usually use here instead of counter. It does exactly the same thing. But because we write for loops so often, i, which usually stands for like index, is typically what you use when you're using for loops. So I've removed the word counter and I've just made it i instead of using the word counter. It's the same exact thing. You can name your variable single letters and it works exactly the same way. And also another reason that you can use a variable like letter i is that if you were to write another loop inside of here, watch what I use for this variable. I use the letter j. So I go i, j. If I were to write another loop, I'd probably use k, and an l, and m, and n, and o, and p. You don't really need more than that. If you have more than three loops, it's probably a bad idea. However, Keep in mind that this is really important that I use a different variable here. A bug, I just had this bug. I actually just had this bug where I accidentally did this. Can you guys see what I did wrong? I used the same variable here and I declared it twice. 
what happens in this case is this, this is called shadowing. I've created a variable here that overrides the value of the variable here, which means the value inside here is actually going to use this. And then when I get back to this loop, it runs this all over again. It's really important that I do uh, J here. And I'm going to do um, a space here. And I'm going to show you guys how to do the multiplication table as well. And I'm going to do an ENDL. I can nest these numbers together. I can write out the matrix by separating them out. Let's do something a little bit more reasonable than 100. Let's do 10. Can anyone tell me what this is going to print out? Just like that. Zero to 10. OK. I know we're running out of time, but how would I get it to print out five rows of numbers instead of 10 rows? Which of these numbers do I need to change to get it to print out five rows instead of 10? Which of these two numbers do I need to change? So one of these two. Can anyone tell me whether it's the one on line number five or the one on line number seven? Anthony, give me, a, give me an idea. Five. Yeah, I have to change one of these to five. Which one of these do I change to five? Line five. Oh, line five. Okay. <laughs> should be more explicit. Yes, because this outer loop controls the rows of how many rows I loop over. When we're making a game like checkers or chess, this is going to be the rows, while this represents the columns. So if I want to print out eight columns, six rows of eight columns each, I do that. So I'm going to use this to my advantage to print out a multiplication table. If I want to, I can print out a multiplication table by changing this to count from 1. And I just multiply those two numbers together. And now I have five rows of five columns. And the value of each of those is the multiplication of i times j, which gives me this nice little column here. And I can do this 10 times. And that's how you get multiplication. So uh, let me give you guys your homework. This is the multiplication table you guys can see. And you can always nest it. And we're going to review this next week as well. But I want to give you guys the homework on Zool. Okay. Okay. If you didn't get enough of dice rolling, I'm going to give it to you again. <laughs> uh, this time it's a little simpler. But uh, I want you to write a dice rolling program that only rolls 20-sided dice. But I want you to ask for how many dice they want to roll. Which means you have to use a for loop in this case instead of a while loop to do this. Okay? So you ask, how many 20-sided dice do you want to roll? You'll, if the user types in 10, you're going to use a for loop. You're going to roll 10 dice inside that for loop. Okay? Not allowed to use a while loop. The second is you're going to use another for loop to implement what's called a factorial. The factorial number is just a number multiplied by itself, minus 1, repeated until you get down to 0. So if I have a number like 5, the factorial 5, which is represented like this, or 5 factorial, is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. The factorial of 10 is 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 continue until you times 1. Okay. So I want you to calculate the factorial of a number that the user types in, but I want you to use a for loop for it. It's a very common programming interview question. Not really practical, though. I don't really know like what situations you would use factorial in for games. I'm just going to be honest. I don't think I've ever written something that used a factorial. However, it's perfect for learning for loops. So that's why I'm giving it to you guys. Um, so those are the two that I want you guys to do for next week.
And both of these need to use a for loop. And I put this up on Zool so you guys can grab it. Uh, if there's any questions, I'll be here after class. And uh, if you guys need more help, let me know and I can uh, help you.